7. And I think I'll have you stand while I read the passage to us. Uh, 3 John, verses 9 through uh, 13. Dear, uh, sorry, not there. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. So if I come, I'll call attention to what he is doing, gossiping maliciously about us. Not satisfied with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone, and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to do so with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace to you. The friends here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> This is our 21st and final uh, session from the Letters of John, and uh, I have learned something out of it, I hope you have, but uh, Third John, I mentioned to you last week, is the shortest book in the Bible, and we looked at the first eight verses last week, here that the, the remaining well, five, um, and uh, We'll, there's not a ton here, but uh, I'm sure there's more for someone that's a better expositor than I am. But I'm going to share with you what I've learned. Uh, if you go to a movie theater these days and you get there before the actual movie starts, you'll be subjected, in addition to trailers for all the other movies they want you to come see, at some point right before the movie starts, there'll be a public service announcement about not making noise during the movie, about not talking during the movie. Um, it's probably more uh, assumed that if you go, rather than announced, that if you go to a live theater presentation, you go see a play, that you will behave in a manner worthy of what we have come to expect is a good audience. But that's actually somewhat a recent uh, phenomenon in the grander scheme of the history of productions, because it hasn't been all that long ago, I mean, before any of us were born, but still in the grander scheme of things, not all that long ago, that, that dr these sorts of dramatic presentations in theaters, they were like an event that audiences looked forward to to seeing what was going on on stage, but also they sort of participated in, in a way. Um, classical performances. Like if you go to, a, well, it's been a while since I've been, but Chicago Symphony Orchestra, if you were to buy a ticket for that production, they, you're gonna get like browbeat by people around you if you make noise during that performance. They expect to be silent from the audience. In fact, many of those uh, performances like that, out in the foyer, they'll have a bowl of cough drops. They want you to take that so that you're not coughing. And I know everyone, when I, I've told that to people before, I've told kids, and they're like, oh, they care if you cough? You, yeah, they expect you to be silent. Silent. And if you start coughing, guaranteed somebody's gonna turn around and just give you the evil eye. But it didn't always used to be that way, even in classical performances. It used to be there was a lot of audience interaction with what was going up on stage. Uh, and like in a play, there was a lot of that. One, one thing that would happen, like in a, in a play, for example, um, and it would happen with some regularity, was when the villain of the story would show up on stage. When that character appeared on stage, the audience would usually like break out in hissing. because he's the bad guy. If, if we were seeing a dramatic presentation of the story that's going on that's represented in 3 John, at this point, then, we'd need to be ready to hiss because the villain, as it were, is Diotrephes. Diotrephes is the bad guy here. 
John says, I'm going to read it now, uh, part of it in uh, New King James. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I'll call to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words. And not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Now, some commentators make the case that when John mentions having written to the church, that he is referring to 2 John. I mean, that would make sense, but others hold that it is some letter that is no longer, that we don't have. It's some letter lost to us. In either case, the goals that John had in mind when he wrote that letter, and when he sent that letter, the goals that he had in mind for the church were not achieved. <coughs> it didn't work. Whatever he was trying to Whatever message he was trying to get across, it didn't, it didn't take. Have you ever heard somebody make a case uh, for, for or saying something along the lines that would indicate that they believe that God's will, God's will will always be accomplished? Have you ever heard something like that? Yeah. God's will, it's always going to be accomplished. You just can't thwart God's will. Well... Could I point out to you that uh, we actually don't believe that? And there's good reasons why we don't believe that. Largely, mainly, because Scripture doesn't teach that. No, wait a minute. No, I, Scripture doesn't teach that. The people that might say such a thing, that, you know, God's will, always gonna, God's always going to get his will. He's always going to have his way on and on. The people that say that, I know they think they have good reasons for that. They're going to speak about like God's sovereignty, that he is ruler over everything. True, true. His preeminence, he's above everything and before everything. Also true. But consider this. Let's, let's just make this a thought piece. If someone were to ask you, did Judas go to heaven? We answer no. no. Okay. All right. Um, and if they said, well, you say that, do you have any scriptural proof for that? Well, yes. And I'll just share, share you the reference. It's Matthew 26, 24 that says, and Jesus speaking, the son of man will go just it is, as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the son of man. It'd be better for him if he had not been born. See, <clears throat> I have talked with people before, not a lot, but some, more in my college days, that they would have held to a position, a, a couple, would have held to a position that Judas betraying Jesus was doing the will of God because Jesus needed to suffer and die. And so Judas was playing a part. And so he did what God expected of him. And so he went to heaven. Except scripture doesn't say that. Jesus, and I, I'm going to trust him now more than this uh, dime store theologian that I was talking to at that time. I'm going to trust Jesus when he says, woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It'd be better for him if he had never been born. Now, if a person ends up in heaven, it could not be said, realistically, that it would have been better if they'd never been born. Because ending up in heaven for all eternity, that sounds like a good reason to be born. Therefore, Judas, the betrayer, according to Scripture, is not in heaven. You might say, well, okay, sure, but so what? Well, now let me bring up another verse. 2 Peter 3, 9, first part of that verse, that says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slow, slowness. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Okay, so according to that verse, which is in the Bible, 
Who does God want to come to repentance? Everybody. Everyone. Okay. Does everyone come to repentance? No. No. Numerous passages in the Bible would tell us that. I mean, Jesus again. Uh, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that follow that way. But straight and narrow is the way that leads to righteousness. And few, Jesus said, many are called, few are chosen. He said all sorts of things like that. <laughs> so God, therefore, if he wants everyone to come to repentance, but everyone doesn't come to repentance, then God does not always get what he wants. Now, that might bother some people. Well, wait a minute, God is sovereign. This is why some people land at a viewpoint that God only really chose certain people to be in heaven. And they call those people the elect. And certain people were not chosen, and they are not elect. And so in that view, the God of all mercy <laughs> called some people to live and die and go to hell. I don't find that scriptural. Nope. Okay? Even, so like, this idea of, well, God is sovereign. I know he is. I know he is. But see, here's the thing. John, the, the apostle, he was Jesus' chosen apostle. He was given authority over the churches and the ability to speak and write and do miracles. He wasn't mistaken. Jesus knew he made the right choice. John knew what he wanted for this church, but it didn't happen. Because ultimately, and this is why God doesn't always get his way, because God has given everyone a free will. He's given everyone the, the, the right to choose to love him or to reject him. Jesus on the cross, there's your visual representation of that very concept. He's on the cross. There's a thief. There's a thief. This thief rejected Jesus. This thief accepted him. Jesus didn't say, now hang on. We're going to get this guy too. No, he didn't do that. He just accepted this one that used the free will that God gave him to do that. So if it bothers you when, when pastor says, God doesn't always get his way, if that bothers you, well, then how about this as a way of wrapping your mind around it? God's ultimate will, his desire, is that people would come to know him. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. God, it is not his will that any should come fall away, that all should come to repentance. But God also, from the creation, made you a certain way. He made you with a free will, and he won't violate that because it would be violating what he did at the start. He made you with a free will. He made Adam and Eve with a free will, and he looked at them and said, very good. That's really good. Knowing they could use that free will and would to make a wrong choice. Now, if that's confusing to you at all, uh, then you must be really thinking about it. Because it ought to be a little bit confusing. But I can't wrap my mind around the idea that God has made the ultimate choice for people. That he's made the choice, not you. That you're really just sort of pretending that you made a choice. No, I don't think so. God gave a free will. And he doesn't always get his, he puts his will secondary to some other things. Okay, Just like it's appointed unto man once to die, then the judgment. Even if God especially likes someone. You know, so, you know, I really like that guy. He died. Let's raise him from the dead again. But let's, not forever, not forever just to have another life. Let's have, him have another little go round. No. Or he doesn't like say, he died and, you know, he wasn't really ready. But that's okay. Let's not judge him. Let's just bring him. No, he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. 
Okay, so God has, um, he has set up certain ways he works, and that's how he works. Okay, so John's plans, I said all that's kind of a diversion, but that's okay. John's plans for this church, John as the chosen apostle from Jesus, so John the messenger, his plans for this church were being thwarted. They weren't happening the way he wanted them to. And the reason they weren't was because of this guy that was there named Diotrephes. Wouldn't it be cool to have your name written in the Bible? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Unless your name's like Judas yeah. or Ahab or Diotrephes or Jezebel, then not so good to have your name written in the Bible. That falls under the category of, you know, you can either be a wonderful example or a terrible warning. And, and Diotrephes is the warning. Verse 9, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I'll call to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words. And not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. So this guy, Diotrephes, in the New King James, he loves to have the preeminence in the NIV. He loves to be first. He loves to be first. Why might that be a problem? Is there any scripture that we might refer to that would say that that's a problem, wanting to be first? Book of others, the same chapter would say. Okay. God's first, yes. Jesus said, if you want to be the greatest, you need to be the least. The, the one that's last will be first, and the first will be last, right? So this guy's, this guy's got things out of whack. He had decided, Diotrephes that is, that his place in this church, now he was a leader of some sort in this church, but he had decided that his place was bigger than it should have been. That he was more important than he should have been. You might say that Diotrephes' problem was he didn't know his place. A lot of people get really, they get their back up if you say things like that now. You suggest that somebody ought to know their place. Oh my goodness, we don't like that kind of talk. Diotrephes had gotten too big for his bridges as would have been said when I was a kid, and some of you. He was a leader in the church. He might have been the leader, but he didn't receive the ones that John had sent. John had sent some people to the church with a message, and this guy, Diotrephes, says, keep walking. You're not welcome here. Go somewhere else. He didn't receive them. Maybe Diotrephes was standing on the instruction in John's earlier letter when John wrote about not allowing false teachers in the church. And he's like, yeah, well, I can't have you here because John said. But he was wrong because he didn't have a discernment about like who was who and what was what. Now, <clears throat> John mentions another guy, Gaius. He doesn't ask Gaius or he doesn't send another secondary to go challenge Diotrephes. John, it seems that John knows that that's something that he's going to have to take care of personally. He's going to do that. John then would confront him. He would remind him of what he's doing and the words he's using. How many of you like personal confrontation? Okay, not to me, none. Uh, I think personal, com personal confrontation is extremely difficult for most people. It was for me. I, 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 when I say it was, I want to give a, 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 a disclaimer right now. I'm not saying it isn't at some level now, but I got better at it over the last 10 or 15 years. And I practiced in school, not with kids. That kind of That's not personal confrontation. I mean, some people might think it is, but I'm talking about with a peer, with another adult. That some people, boy, they'll do anything to avoid personal confrontation. But I've just found that so many issues are made better when you confront them. When you confront them. Um, 
I think that the church, both the one John's writing about, this church, and all churches, would just almost without doubt be better off in many instances if we just bring ourselves to this level of personal confrontation. Oh, I couldn't do that, Pastor, because they don't like me. That might be exactly why you do it. You find out why. The problem is, see, I, I think so many people, especially in church, have equated confrontation with something bad. Confrontation, that is, by definition, that's bad. Well, no, not always. Not always. Some people in the church think it's almost something sinful to confront. But I just think that's fear and a temptation of the enemy. I do. See, I, I had an experience once at school where um, there was a teacher who is a good guy. I liked him, but he... I, I'm going to say this, it's going to sound like I'm being negative. I, I don't mean it to sound like I'm being negative. He liked to be Mr. Positive with kids. And there was an issue where I came down after lunch and I'm going to go in the music room to teach sixth grade music. Sixth grade band is starting at the same time. I didn't direct sixth grade band. I walked past my room. No, I have extra time. The bell hadn't rung yet. And I walked past the band room and I'm like, there's a bunch of kids in there. So I stick my head in. No teacher anywhere. I'm like, where are you guys from? Oh, so so and so let us out. Let you out of class early? Yeah. I said, you don't need to be down here without teacher. That's a bad thing. So I go in and do my class. Well, next day or a day later, it happened again. I said, why are you down here before the bell has rung? Our teacher let us out. Okay. So I decided it's time for personal confrontation. Most of my colleagues would have sat around and just badmouthed the guy. And never said a word about it. You just talk to other people about it. That's Christians would never do that. <laughs> we do like we just do anything to avoid personal confrontation. But I think sometimes we sell the other person short, and we sell ourselves short, and we make too much out of it. So what I did. I got out a $10 bill or a $20 bill. I think I got a $20 bill out of my wallet. And I had it in my pocket. And I walked into this person's classroom before school the next day. And I said, hey, and he said, hey, how you doing, Mr. Birch? And I said, uh, good. And I said, listen, I, I think it's a little short. I, I, I slid the $20 bill across to him. And he's like, what are you talking about? And I said, well, I, I thought maybe you're clock was broken and you needed a new one because kids keep ending up down at the other end of the building before the bell rang. <laughs> and then I smiled. And he said, well, like maybe once. And I smiled and went. And he said, all right, I'll take care of it. Problem was solved. We were friends. Never had another. <laughs> Sometimes we have to confront things. Rachel had a situation at our other church was not her fault, but we came to find out that someone was upset because they had seen her with somebody else, and uh, and there's this big thing, and she's like, well, not, that never happened, and so she went and talked to the person about it, and it wasn't it wasn't comfortable, but she did it, and it made it better. <laughs> Sometimes we just have to confront. Jesus taught about confrontation. He said that if we were praying and then we realized that somebody had something against us, that we should leave that there and then go make it right. And you might be tempted to think, well, that's not confrontation. But I think that's only because we have this overall negative view of what confrontation is. The confrontation shouldn't be terrible, even if it's difficult. It could be as simple as asking a question like, hey, this happened, this, what? Could I ask, why did, why did this happen the way it did? It could be simple like that. Or we could say, why, why did you react the way you did? I think the word just means face-to-face. -face. Yeah. Confront. Face -to -face. Yes. 
with fronts. Con means with, and yes, face to face. See, if we go and, and, and we could just say, have, have I done something to offend you? And I, I've asked that question before at work. And they told me what a terrible teacher I was. And that's what offended me. <laughs> and I kind of chuckled and I said, well, I'm not sure what I can do about that. But I don't want there to be anything between us. Uh, if we ask that question, we've got to be ready for a positive answer. And like, yes, you have done something to offend me. And then be ready to own it and fix it. We are the people that love each other. We don't want there to be things between us. A lot of times the conflict that we fear is just the thing standing between us and a better relationship. And then if, if that's the truth, then we might have to come to the conclusion that maybe it's the enemy of our souls and the enemy of the church that makes us fear so that we don't make the relationship better. The issue is with Diotrephes, though, was not a simple misunderstanding. When it says that he put them out of the church, these ones that John had sent. He put them out of the church. John uses the same word there for what Jesus did with demons. Jesus put the demons out of those people. He cast them out. That's the same language that John's using here for what this guy did. He, he threw these people out of the church unceremoniously. And in his mind, he's throwing them out permanently. So what ended up happening with Diotrephes? Well, I mean, we can only offer conjecture. But we are studying 3 John, and there's not first Diotrephes in the Bible. So I'm going to say that probably John and his way triumphed, ultimately, and Diotrephes in his way, either Diotrephes repented and realized he was in the wrong, or he became, you know, a sad story in the long history of the church. Uh, verse 11, beloved, do not imitate what's evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who is he who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius is another guy. Demetrius has a good testimony from all and from the truth itself. And we also bear witness, and you know that our testimony is true. I had many things to write, but I do not wish to write to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly, and we shall speak face to face. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. So John gives some, some great instruction here. Don't imitate what is evil. Is he referring to Diotrephes? I mean, he could be. Or it could just be a general statement. Don't imitate what's evil. Demetrius is another guy from this church. I mentioned last week, John used a phrase in verse 2 of this third John that was a common type of greeting. And I talked about you weren't supposed to take it literally. It wasn't a health, wealth, and prosperity sort of gospel thing. Here's another example of similar language. He says, Demetrius has a good testimony from all. Everyone likes him. Well, that probably can't literally be true because if John really likes Demetrius and Demetrius really likes John, well, probably Diotrephes doesn't like him. Okay, so it is just... A way of speaking. It's a way of speaking that we all do. But when it comes to the Bible, we've, we've so, and I think it's at a good motivation, we revere what's in the scripture. We want it to be, you know, true. And so we make it do something it, doesn't, it shouldn't have to do. It's, it's hyperbolic language. It's exaggeration. It's, you know, you... You all, if you had kids, at some point you looked at them and you said, I have told you this a hundred times. Okay, first of all, you have not. You aren't keeping track. You're making a point. The person you're speaking to knows you are making a point. You're making a point. It's a way of communicating. Okay? Or you may be one of those sappy people that puts on Facebook when your, your kid has a birthday or something and you say, I love you to the moon and back. No, you don't. That's nonsense. You've never been to the moon and you're not going anytime soon. No, it's a way of speaking. Okay? We don't have to, we don't want to be that guy or that, that gal when it comes to that stuff and say, that's not really what that means. You just look like a dork when you do that. Okay? So when he said, it's, it's hyperbolic language. Now, when we read the Bible, 
See, we believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible. Well, when I say we, this church as led by your pastor and the Nazarene church as a denomination, we believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible, but we do not believe in a literalistic interpretation of the Bible that like strains at every word and makes it say things that the writer didn't mean. The Bible is literally true, but by that we mean that the person that wrote that, what they wrote is literally what they meant when they wrote those words. And so when you say, I told a kid today in band, one of my sixth grade boys was messing with the sixth or the eighth grade girl next to him. She's like this much taller than him. They're both in drums. And he had, I looked over, I'd seen it once, and then I looked over another time, he had the bass drum beater, and he was booping her on the head with it. <laughs> and I said to him, I said, Amos, if you do that again, she is going to just beat you mercilessly with that stick she's holding. And I might see it, but I won't see it. <laughs> and I said, she's got a certain skill set that she's developed over the years. She will hunt you down. She will find you, and she will kill you. Okay, I was making a point. He smiled, laughed, never did it again. We all knew what I meant, but see, the Bible has some examples of, of like that exaggerated sort of language. Song of Solomon comes to mind, but there's others where like, wait, I thought we believed literal. No, I mean, you don't make a poem be literal. You make it, it let it speak the way it wants to speak. Okay, so as we read the Bible, we want to understand what the Bible, the writer of that part of the Bible is speaking to us. And understanding that starts with like identifying what type of literature it is. Why don't you say it was the Bible? Yeah, but whether it's history like Acts or an epistle like 3 John or a prophecy like Hosea, they all work differently. And as we, as we kind of learn as we read the Bible, that's, that's part of the fun of doing it. We kind of get closer in that way. John's letter closes in, in a really traditional way. He got more to say, but he didn't want to write it. He wanted to come say it in person. It's kind of so, you know, we write those kinds of things in letters if we still write letters, you know. Wish you were here. Can't wait to see you again. That's another hyperbole, by the way. The next time you say, I can't wait to, and then whatever. Yes, you can. You will. I, I, but that's what we say, right? John wanted to say it. Did he get the chance to go in person? Well, we don't know. Maybe you can ask him when you get to heaven and you see him. So next week, we're going to be studying a different thing from the Bible. But I'm not telling you that. <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for all we've learned from the epistles of John. Thank you that these people were faithful to you to do what you asked them to do. And because of it, we can grow closer to you and learn from them and from their example. Help us to take from uh, John tonight the one thing he said, don't imitate evil. Help us to, to imitate what's good and to turn away from what's evil. Be with each one of us, Lord, as we to uh, go into our micro mission and reach out to other people for uh, your goodness. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming tonight.